So let's begin our discussion of the reaction of alcohols by talking about a process called dehydration. Okay, so this is the reverse of a reaction that you learned uh, last semester when you talked about uh, chemistry of alkenes. Um, so hydration of an alkene, which was the addition of water across the carbon-carbon double bond. And so the dehydration reaction is just going to be the exact opposite of that. So we will have an uh, alcohol, so there's our OH, and then I'm just going to generically draw some uh, carbons with some substituents. And so what we'll need here then is an adjacent CH bond. So our alcohol with an adjacent CH, and then we're going to do some chemistry that will then convert this back into an alkene, right? And so we get water out, so we have dehydrated the alkene. Okay, so there's two ways that uh, we're going to talk about how to do this. Um, but I want to first um, remind you of um, some chemistry that you learned about alkyl halides. So you learned a similar process um, in terms of the reactivity of, uh, say, an alkyl bromide. Okay, And um, as a, uh, hopefully you remember, uh, this can um, happen, this, this elimination type of reaction can happen by two different pathways. So the first would be where that, that bromide ion just ionizes um, as the first step. Okay, and so that would then give, um, whoops, that would then give an intermediate uh, carbocation. Okay, so let's see, and there's our cation with our bromide, All right? And um, then, uh, then we can have our base pull off a proton and reform the alkene. Okay. Right, and so uh, you might remember that uh, as being the, the E1 elimination type of mechanism. And the other way that this can happen, and I'll just use a different, um, different color for the arrows, is that uh, this can happen um, sort of all at once, where the base pulls off the proton and at the same time um, causes the, the bromide to leave. And we go directly to the alkene, okay? And so that, oh, sorry, not water, um, HBR. Um, and this is then known as the E2 mechanism because there are uh, two molecules involved in that rate determining step, whereas there was only one in the E1 mechanism. Now, the way that we're going to um, think about the dehydration of alcohols um, is in some ways similar um, to the, the E1 mechanism, um, but uh, I want to caution you that it's not, it doesn't directly happen on the alcohol. Okay, so let me just move up here. Um, and so this is, this is the type of uh, thing that you, that you want to not do in an alcohol mechanism in general, uh, which is to have this OH group ionize directly. Okay, so... Right, so that would be analogous to um, the E1 mechanism um, where the, the uh, bromine uh, carbon bond um, it, it simply undergoes ionization. This does not happen directly with alcohols. And the reason is because um, an OH group is not a good leaving group. In fact, this is a, a strong, you know, a reasonably strong base, right? And to leave behind a carbocation and then a strong base, this just isn't going to happen. So don't do this okay and your, whenever you're drawing mechanisms do not do that direct um, ionization of an alcohol to give an OH group that is not going to happen okay instead what we need to do is we need to first convert the the hydroxyl group into a good leaving group and the way that we're going to do that is simply with acid okay so this is uh, this is the first way that we can do dehydration of an alcohol uh, which is acid catalyzed Okay, so we're going to take our alcohol, this is just the generic representation, um, we're going to treat it with um, some acid and that will then give us out our alkene and obviously then we're generating a molecule of water. 
Okay. So uh, how does this work? So let's talk about the mechanism. Well, what we're going to do here is, like I just said, convert that OH group into something that can serve as a leaving group for an, an E1 type of mechanism. So I've got my OH. It's not yet a leaving group. But if I take my proton, right, that OH group can be uh, protonated. Okay, and we've seen this a few times before already in this semester that you can then generate an H2O molecule, right? H2O plus, which this is now going to be a good leaving group because it can leave now not as OH minus, but as H2O, as a neutral H2O molecule. So that's good. And so now we can go ahead and let this ionization happen. All these steps are reversible. So we get to our carbocation now in this, at this point, um, and now we're then going to be able to utilize a base. And this isn't going to take much of a base, just water itself will be just fine. Um, and that's, that's the solvent we're, uh, we're likely to be doing this in. We pull off a proton and then we are able to generate our alkene um, in that final step. Okay, and so actually all of this is reversible all along the way. And that's how we do an acid catalyzed dehydration. Now you, you might recognize that if I go from right to left, that's the hydration of an alkene. And so those are just the, the backwards and forwards reactions. So all we're doing here is pushing the equilibrium um, to the right so that we get the alkene out. And oftentimes that will be done um, by mass transfer, um, uh, oftentimes by distilling out the alkene as it's formed. Okay, and if we want to get go the other way, we're just going to do it um, in in uh, in water where we leave everything in the pot. Okay, so uh, you can see by the mechanism what's required here is we have to generate um, this intermediate, this carbocation. So you can probably guess at what kind of substrates are going to be. Um, uh, applicable to the acid catalyzed dehydration and they're usually going to be um, uh, tertiary alcohols tertiary alcohol substrates okay because those are the ones uh, that can lead to tertiary carbocations so tertiary alcohol you ionize um, you make that water group leave and you're left with a tertiary carbocation so that's usually stable enough to do this um, and that you know that can actually be a, a reasonable process in the lab without overly um, harsh conditions. So um, I might uh, take this um, cyclohexyl alcohol, um, treat it with a little bit of, of aqueous acid and distill out my alkene product, right? So that, that's probably um, going to be a good process. And, um, uh, and then, so that might work fine. But uh, for other alcohols, so, so primary and secondary, it's not usually going to be a great process. Maybe sometimes with secondary, we could get that to go um, if, we, if we really forced it. Um, but generally, this is going to be um, mostly limited to tertiary alcohols. Okay. All right, so what would we do if we wanted to dehydrate um, a different alcohol, something that wasn't so activated? What, what might we do? Well, fortunately, there's another method, um, and I will call this a milder method, because uh, you know maybe our substrate isn't uh, amenable to the formation of carbocations, um, and or maybe our the uh, there's other things in our molecule that aren't going to be um, so stable to throwing in um, harsh acid. Um, so we would like to have an, a milder method, and that milder method um, are two reagents. Um, POCl3, and then we need a base involved. So pyridine is the, is the method of choice. So the way that this looks is I might take an alcohol. So I could take that same alcohol, actually. And I treat this with POCl3 and pyridine. And I get out then my de dehydration product. Okay. So the same as in uh, the case of um, the acid catalyzed dehydration, but uh, this is a, actually a very mild uh, method and, and to the point that you know, we could uh, typically run this at maybe zero degrees Celsius and still get this to go. So how does this one work? Okay, well, I'm going to 
I'm just going to generically use this substrate. Um, I could use any stout substrate. Um, and so here is my POCl3 reagent. Okay, so it's, a, it's an electrophilic phosphorus site. So what I can do is I can uh, use the hydroxyl group, now in this case as a nucleophile, and this will displace one of the chlorides on the phosphorus. Okay, so when that happens, I have connected my alcohol to my phosphorus in this way. All right, and uh, I'm here is where I'm losing a molecule of, of HCl, right? So the H on the hydroxyl and the chloride. So that's where the pyridine comes in place is to um, is uh, one equivalent of the pyridine to mop up um, that proton. Um, and now uh, what happens next, so what, what we've done is we've converted that OH into what is now actually a good leaving group. So, so this whole thing here, right, that whole thing is now a good leaving group, right? It's happy to go away with uh, a pair of electrons um, because now you've got this, all of these um, groups are, are uh, you know, electron withdrawing, um, electronegative. Um, and they're pulling away uh, electron density. So if I form an anion on that oxygen, it's not going to be unhappy like an OH minus would be. Now it's actually going to be a, a pretty stable anion. Um, and so I just need a little bit of help. So we're going to use molecule of pyridine. Remember, this is basic. The pyridine pulls off the H, and then we can do what you might recognize now as an E2 uh, elimination to generate our alkene, right? And then the byproducts here are going to be the anion that we just kicked off. And then we will have a molecule of pyridinium, right? So it's pyridine that's, that's been protonated, so that's our the, that's the, the sort of the byproduct salts that we just generated. But that's how we form the alkene, okay? So it's an E2, E2 type of elimination. So you see that alcohols don't do E1s directly. You have to protonate them, and then they can ionize. And they also don't do E2 eliminations directly. You have to first convert the hydroxyl into a good leaving group, and then with the base you can do an E2. So uh, that's that's important to keep in mind. No direct E1 or E2 with alcohols. You have to do something. Now, there's an important point um, that we need to talk about in terms of this deprotonation step, okay? And that has to do with the um, stereochemistry. Okay, so if you are a little rusty on stereochemistry, um, you might want to go to uh, the the book and um, and just brush up on um, some of those principles. Um, but this is actually very important here. Uh, the orientation of the CH bond that we're uh, pulling off the proton and that leaving group oxygen is very important. Um, and they basically, they have to uh, be trans to each other, okay? So if I were to draw my, my uh, cyclohexane, in this case, um, in a chair conformation, so I can see the stereochemistry. What has to happen is, so here's my leaving group. Okay, CL, CL, right? You can see how this, this sigma bond is, is oriented in an axial position. The CH that I'm pulling off here also has to be axial, but it has to be, so these have to be 180 degrees from one another, okay? So this here and that there, have to be uh, what's called uh, um, trans, or, or if you think about the angles, 180 degrees from one another, okay? That has to be the case. So that when we use our base, we deprotonate, and then these electrons in that sigma bond kick in and then displace the leaving group. So that has to be the case, all right? Um, if we don't have that, um, it's not going to work. So. For example, if I were to, I'll draw the same exact intermediate, okay? So if I were to think about that other proton, so not the one that we just used there, but this one, um, that actually can't work. So if a base tries to deprotonate that, 
um, those electrons aren't aligned um, with that bond. And so they're, they're almost um, 90 degrees, they're, they're orthogonal to each other. Um, so that can't happen. So that is not going to work, okay? So what does that matter? Um, well, let me show you, let me show you a specific case um, and how this will actually play out. Okay, so, oops, see my color. Okay, so this is the, the therefore. The, so this would be a, an example of the consequence of the stereochemical requirement. So let's say that I have an alcohol where here the, the OH group is up and then there's an adjacent um, stereocenter. So here um, I, I have one proton but that proton is, is back, okay? So if I treat this with POCl3, um, what I can get out is uh, this, this alkene, okay? But if I look at the opposite, or not the opposite, sorry, the, the diastereomer of this material, right? so now I'm gonna have the methyl group back and then the proton up. If I do the exact same reaction, you, you might think that the product would be the same, but in fact, it is not the same. Uh, what I get out is this product. Right? So it actually, it, it eliminates to the, to the other side, to the other, to the other side of the alcohol. Okay? So the question is, why is that happening? Well, again, it comes down to stereochemistry. So if I were to draw the chair conformation of these, these uh, of the intermediate um, after reacting with POCl3, right? I'm going to put here's P. I'm going to put my uh, leaving group now axial, and in the case where the methyl is up, um, I'm going to have my um, my methyl group in the equatorial position, and then my proton is going to be also axial. So they're both axial, and now this can uh, occur quite nicely to deprotonate and do just like we said, and that can then form that uh, isomer. And the more substituted alkene is, is more stable, and so we, we would expect uh, that to happen. But now in the case of the opposite uh, diastereomer where the methyl group is back, we draw the exact same intermediate Okay, so here's our leaving group, axial position, and now, right, when, it, when it's in the confirmation that this is axial, that means that the methyl group is going to be axial. Okay, so now the proton in that position, uh, just, it can never be uh, transdiaxial, so 180 degrees from that leaving group, it just can't happen. So the only place where there can be a proton that is in that, uh, necessary position is actually at the other position. So there's a nice transdiaxial proton, okay? And so now the base uh, can, can deprotonate there, and then you're going to form the alkene at that position, right? So that's the only place it can happen in, the, in that stereoisomer. So, this, so the stereochemistry absolutely dictates the regioisomer that we're going to get out of these reactions. And so that's why it's important. So with dehydration, um, dehydration doesn't matter. Um, you form a carbocation, and any of the um, the protons can then eliminate uh, to to form an alkene, and you're going to tend to go to the most substituted alkene because it's most stable. In the case of the POCl3, though, um, the stereochemistry matters because this is an E2 elimination, and so you have to pull off the proton as the leaving group is is leaving, so that you have orbital alignment requirements for this process.